who am I to judge? And I thought that was rather interesting. And number two, I thought today's gospel, Matthew 6, was beautiful with, your, with the cardinals, which you said were um, uh, overspending in Germany. I thought that was a beautiful statement. And finally, I met Bish, um, Cardinal O'Brien at the Seminary of the Immaculate Conception. I don't know if you know who he is, but he gave a powerful talk describing what it was like to elect this pope and how fast they came to electing him. And uh, I thought that was fascinating. So is, I agree, although it's interesting. Was there a question in there? Uh, oh, but what did you think? Um, were you surprised that the advocate um, oh. came out? But what did you think of that? Well, listen, I mean, I was just doing an interview, you know, I, as, as many of you know, I work for CNN, and so I was on today talking about the whole Francis effect thing because of the anniversary coming up next week. Uh, and they were asking me, uh, you know, I how, the, the gist of the question was, isn't it weird to have a pope that's this popular? To which my response was, well, you really haven't been paying attention, okay? I mean, I covered John Paul II. Okay, I mean, John Paul II was a magnet for humanity like no other, okay? I was in the Philippines in 1995 when he had a crowd of 5 million people. And actually, if you look at the Pew numbers that are coming out tonight, what they will tell you is that as popular as Francis is, his numbers are still slightly lower than John Paul II's were at his peak. So, the, the, you know, it's not a novelty to have a popular pope. The novelty about Francis, okay, I think, uh, is that he is every bit as popular outside the church as he is inside the church, and in particular, he's popular among secularists who for a long time have kind of had a chip on their shoulder about the church. Okay, because I think what they see in Francis, I think they're, it's slowly dawning on them that he's not a doctrinal radical. He's not going to overturn Catholic teaching on, on some of the issues that have been the flashpoints, but that he is projecting a kind of new ethos uh, of tolerance and compassion and kind of meeting the secular world halfway. So the advocate thing, look, I mean, uh, part of this you have to understand is that there's no hotter commodity in, on the global stage right now than Pope Francis. I mean, to be quite honest with you, the advocate could publish the phone book, and if they put Francis on the cover, they would sell a couple million copies, okay? So part of this is just mercenary logic, all right? But I think part of it also reflects the fact that, that the secular world, including those currents in the secular world that traditionally have been most hostile to the church, I think they see in Francis not an enemy but a dialogue partner, and I think that's one of the unique things about his charisma. Um, was there an event or a trend that led us to having this wonderful man elected pope? And do you think subsequent, they knew his... Um, reputation before, is there, has he surprised the hierarchy who elected him? Yeah, the, the buyer's remorse question, right? Um, was there an event? Yes, there was an event, ladies and gentlemen, and let us dare not forget this. L let me say, I said before, I have covered three popes, okay, John Paul II, Benedict, and, and Francis. Of the three, the one I, by far, that I know the best is Pope Benedict. I, I had covered him. Uh, during most of the 20 years that he was the Vatican's doctrinal czar. I wrote a biography about the guy. Uh, I know him very well on a personal level as opposed, you know, in addition to his policy stands and all of that. Uh, I, I find, and there, this is all by way of saying, that I find myself feeling a little protective of Benedict these days because I am enormously frustrated with what I, what I see as an insipid narrative that has taken shape in my business, which I would term Benedict bad, Francis good. Okay, as if Francis is somehow a repudiation of everything that Benedict stands for. And you will find this, if you want a classic expression of it, go read that Rolling Stone story, you know, which sets Francis up as the complete antithesis, and it uses adjectives like draconian and disastrous to characterize Benedict and so on. What we dare not forget <laughs> is that none of what we were seeing from Pope Francis would be possible had it not been for the single most revolutionary decision made by any pope in the last 600 years, and that was Benedict's decision to voluntarily renounce his office. Okay? I mean, yeah, Francis is a maverick and an innovator, but you want innovation, ladies and gentlemen? There isn't a single thing Francis has done that holds a candle uh, in terms of unpredictability or innovation to Benedict's decision to resign. Yeah, okay, there were a handful of popes who'd resigned before, but the circumstances were wildly different. I mean, they were either facing internal schism or foreign armies, okay? In, in terms of the circumstances in which Benedict resigned, it was basically unprecedented. 
So I would say that was the event. Uh, and it's not just that, you know, by Benedict stepping aside, then of course they had to elect another pope. But Benedict resigning utterly changed the dynamics of the election of March 2013. This is the first papal election in, in 600 years, and again, under these circumstances, the first papal election ever, okay, that didn't follow the death or, in effect, the involuntary removal of a pope. Okay? And I'll tell you, having covered the conclave of 2005, here's what happens when the cardinals of the world come to Rome to elect a pope after the old one has died. You know what happens when a public figure dies. There is a global outpouring of tribute and grief uh, and commemoration and, you know, elogia, right, uh, of the guy who has just died. I mean, if you were in Rome in 2005, I mean, the, the global outpouring of affection and love and sense of loss over John Paul II was just unbelievable. You know, I mean, the, the city of Rome will tell you that in those days when John Paul's body was on display in St. Peter's Square and anybody could come by and pay their respects, some five million Italians showed up and some five million people from outside Italy showed up to file. I mean, 10 million people, okay, over the course of roughly 10 days. I remember on CNN, we interviewed one guy. He was uh, from Chicago, uh, his family's Polish, and when he heard the Pope had died, he, he was a bus driver, if I'm not wrong, I mean, a blue-collar job. He had a few vacation days coming, so he took his vacation days, he packed a bag, he, he, and he thought naively that he would fly over to Rome, pay his respects to the Pope, then spend a few days in Italy on vacation, and then go home, right? Not realizing that 10 million other people had the same idea, okay? So, he, you know, he, he got on a plane, he flew from O'Hare to Fumicino in Rome. He gets in a cab. They take him as close as they could get him to St. Peter's Square, which was like several city blocks away. He spent the next 72 hours in line waiting for those, holding a suitcase, right? Waiting for his, you know, 10, 15 seconds before the body of the deceased pope. And by that stage, his vacation was eaten up, so he just got in a cab and went back to Fumicino and went home. And he told us on air, it was the most moving experience of his life. Now, you multiply that by 10, mil 10 million times, that was the story of those days. My point is that that creates a psychological context in which the cardinals become incredibly invested in continuity, okay? Because, because the, the, the atmosphere suggests to them uh, that there is, that the, the papacy that just ended, you know, was beloved and massively successful and all of that. And, and that's, I think, how Ratzinger got elected in 2005. You know, what I called in my book on Ratzinger the funeral effect. Okay, it was a massive continuity vote. Now, when Benedict decided to step aside rather than waiting to die, what he did is allow, in effect, he allowed the cardinals to have a conversation about the state of the church that was not influenced by the funeral effect. Okay, he allowed them to take a much more objective and measured and balanced look about where things stood and what the church needed. And I think that was a huge ingredient uh, in preparing the way. My point is that if you want somebody to thank for the Francis effect, okay, don't thank my business in the first place. Thank Pope Benedict because he's the one who made it possible. Okay? Uh, now, the buyer's remorse thing. Uh, look, uh, I have probably since, over the last year, since the conclave, I have probably talked to... There were 115 cardinals who went into the Sistine Chapel. Obviously, 114 came back out as cardinals, okay? Uh, of that 114, I've probably talked to 40, 45, so take this for what it's worth, okay? Uh, but the read I get from, so that's like what, maybe a third of the electorate? The read I get from that third uh, is that there are some things about Bergoglio that are absolutely what they expected, uh, and some things that, that or we're just not on their radar screen, okay? So the two things that they will most commonly tell you that, that were what they expected, the profile on Bergoglio in Argentina was that he was this humble, simple man of the poor. So those elements of his papacy track exactly with what they thought they were voting for. Uh, also, the profile on Bergoglio in Argentina was that he was a good manager, a good administrator, good leader, he ran a tight ship. You know, worked his own phone, made his own decisions, was, was very engaged at the level of detail. Uh, and that certainly is how he is proving to act as Pope, and that too is very much what the Cardinals wanted, and they're getting what they voted for. Okay. Now, the two surprises would be, uh, another part of Bergoglio's reputation in Argentina was that he was politically and theologically, he was seen as a conservative, 
Uh, this is largely because there was a falling out in the, Jesuit during, in the Jesuits during the 1970s over liberation theology, and he was on the conservative end of that debate. Uh, and also because in 2010, there was a big dust-up in Argentina over gay marriage, and he took on the Kirshner government you know, against the gay marriage uh, law. Actually, if you drill down in both of those cases, it's a lot more complicated than I just made them sound. Uh, so the surprise for many cardinals is how much of a moderate he's turned out to be as pope. I mean, he's certainly not a liberal, but he very much is a moderate man of the center, fundamentally unideological. Okay? Uh, whereas the cardinals thought they were voting for a reasonably conservative guy. Now, for some, this has been a pleasant surprise. For others, not so much. But in any event, it's a surprise. Okay? Now, the truly surprising thing uh, and here I can quote Cardinal Tim Dolan of New York, who is one of the guys I've talked to about this. And I asked him the very question you just asked me, you know, is, uh, to what extent is Francis a surprise? And what Dolan says is, hey, we knew we were voting for a man of the poor, and we knew we were voting for a good manager. What we did not know is that we were electing a rock star. Okay? <laughs> that element of Francis has been a surprise. But let me tell you, it's not just a surprise to the Tim Dolans of the world, who frankly had never met Jorge Mario Bergoglio before March 2013. Uh, it's been a surprise to people who knew him in Argentina. I mean, case in point, I told you a moment ago he's given five major interviews since, his, his, since he's become pope, right? So in the space of a year. Do you know me how many interviews he gave during his 15 years as the Archbishop of Buenos Aires? Five. He's given him as many in one year as pope as he did in 15 years in Argentina. People who covered this man in Argentina will tell you but first of all, he hated appearing in public. He hated being in the spotlight. He hated being on stage. He would avoid it like the plague. And in those rare instances in which he did have to appear in public, he would typically come off as bore, boring, dull, and gray. He was known in Argentina as the bishop who never smiles, believe it or not. I mean, just as an exercise, for those of you who are web literate, you know, go home tonight and Google Bergoglio Buenos Aires and look at pictures of him as archbishop and compare them to pictures of him as pope. You will notice an astonishing difference. I mean, let me put it this way. When I was in Buenos Aires, I went to visit his sister, Maria Elena, who is his only surviving sibling. It was a family of five, and, and those two are the only ones who are still alive. Uh, she lives in this kind of very modest home about an hour outside Buenos Aires. And I asked her this question, what do you think of the transformation that's come over, her, over your brother? Do you know what her answer was? I don't recognize this guy. <laughs> I don't know who he is. You know? Uh, so the, the point is, this was a surprise not just to the cardinals who elected him. I mean, it's been a surprise to his best friends. You know, there is a kind of transformation. Uh, and I was telling some people at dinner tonight, I'm not a mystic by instinct, okay? I don't automatically look for, for mystical explanations to things. Uh, but, but I do think there is a kind of mystical dimension to this transformation that's come over Bergoglio that you can't ignore. You know, he's told the story. He said that the, the, after his election, he went into the Pauline Chapel in the Vatican before he stepped out into the square because he wanted to pray for a few minutes. And, and in that moment, he has told people that he had an experience of God. He had some kind of brush with the divine that left him with an interior sense of of peace and freedom that's never left him. So, I mean, I, I think that was, uh, that result was essentially unpredictable, okay? And that it certainly has been a surprise and a revelation to the people who elect him. I think we have time for about two more questions, if anyone has any, I think on that side now. Uh, I want to refer to uh, uh, his, uh, not only uh, verbal messages, but his nonverbal messages. And it deals with his selection of the of the recent cardinals, and uh, one of the report in the paper was that, you know, when you come to uh, to be ordained a cardinal, we don't want extravagant parties right. afterwards. Uh, I would like to get your uh, your read on that, whether that was an attack directly on people like Timothy Cardinal Dolan, who brought a thousand people from New York when he was made a cardinal, or is it a, uh, an effort to uh, reduce the classism that's in the church with the bishops and cardinals and, uh, as opposed with the lay people? 
Sure. So if, if you didn't quite, quite catch the question, Pope Francis just celebrated a consistory, which is in the event in which the Pope creates new cardinals. And in advance of this consistory, he had sent out a letter to, these, the, to the 19 new cardinals he created saying, please make sure that uh, your celebrations are, you know, after the event, uh, are modest and sober and, you know, uh, animated by a spirit of concern for the poor. Let me say, first of all, I love Pope Francis. But as a guy who covers the Vatican, I'm a little worried, you know, about this whole dialing down the sumptuous, sumptuousness of it. Because I loved those receptions. I mean, you know, I love the, the goblets of wine and the shrimp cocktail. And, you know, I always tell people I'm all for the option for the poor as long as somebody else is making it, you know. Uh, but, but no, uh, was that an attack on Dolan? <laughs> no. I mean, listen, let me make this point, okay? First of all, Pope Francis comes from the Global South. He comes from Argentina. He is, he is well aware that there are 1.2 billion Catholics in the world, and there are about 67 million Catholics in the United States, which means that we in the United States account for about 6% of the global Catholic population. And another way of putting the point is that 94% of the Catholics in the world aren't like us. So this notion that the Pope gets out of bed in the morning thinking American thoughts or calculates his every decision to send a message to the United States is, frankly, American arrogance. It's fantasy. Okay, so no, Dolan was not in his head. Okay, now, uh, is, however, I mean, was he trying to send a signal uh, with this consistory uh, that the church has to be, you know, he talks all the time about the church going to the peripheries of the world, both the geographical peripheries and the existential peripheries. Was he trying to make a statement about the peripheries? Of course he was. And not just, by the way, I mean, I actually think this is a footnote, this business about making sure your celebrations are sober, okay? But the fundamental way he communicated that was the choice of the people he made cardinals. Okay, bear in mind, 19 new cardinals, 16 of whom are under the age of 80 and therefore eligible to vote for the next pope. Only four Vatican guys and only four Europeans. The rest of them come from all over the world, uh, including the first ever cardinal from Haiti, okay, cardinals from Burkina Faso, from Ivory Coast, I mean, all three of which are, are on top ten lists of the world's most impoverished nations. And in each case, if you drill down, it's not just that he chose cardinals from poor nations, but in, in those countries, he bypassed the archdiocese and made cardinals out of humble bishops from some of the poorest and more obscure dioceses in those countries. So even within those countries, he was going to the peripheries. Okay, and I, I think that was the, I wrote that this was the consistory of the poor. Okay, I think that's the message that Francis was looking to send. You know, and, and by the way, I mean, I think it's, it's very clear that guys are getting the memo, you know, uh, in, in terms of what Francis wants. Uh, I mean, I went to several of the receptions uh, after this particular consistor, and I will tell you they were distinctly more modest uh, than has often been the case. And, and finally, one point. Uh, if you want to find somebody who, you know, a cardinal to hang the wrap on of having, like, over-the-top consistory celebrations, it really wouldn't be Tim, Tim Dolan, because most of those thousand people who came over were actually, you know, cops and firemen and blue-collar folks. I mean, you can, you can roll the clock back to when Ed Egan became the cardinal of New York. The famous story was that there was a member of his consistory delegation who was staying in the... Um, that hotel that's down in Piazza Minerva, I forget, this is the Hotel Minerva, okay, uh, who had to file a police report because $10 million worth of jewelry was stolen out of the safe in her room. Okay, raising the question, who in the world travels with $10 million worth of jewelry? I mean, you know, that was a kind of gold-plated consistory delegation, and, and, and I, I think that's the kind of thing that Francis is trying to recalibrate. Hi, John. Hello Thanks. there. Thanks for, uh, for the words tonight. I have two things I'd like you to comment on. One is the story today from the interview about, uh, about retirement. So um, Francis was commenting about um, the new post-Vatican II um, bishops who right. now retire, right. leading us to think he may retire himself after Benedict's lead. He's, on, he's 77 now. He could wait till 80 or 81, 82 five years maybe at the outset, maybe you'd like to comment on that. Second, the uh, formation of the, the Secretariat for the Economy and um, Cardinal Pell's appointment. Um, love to have your, your idea uh, and read on that and how that may be setting up a parallel curia um, model to sort of fix what's going on there. Okay. 
So let's take those questions in order. First, uh, if you didn't quite get this, the, the Pope gave an interview to the Italian paper Corriere della Sera. I mentioned that. One of the elements in that interview uh, was the issue of papal resignation. Uh, and basically what Francis said is, look, you know, Benedict resigned. Other popes may resign. We don't know. Because uh, this came up in the context of the guy who was doing this interview asked him about a question about his relationship with Benedict. Okay, and he said, we have a great relationship, we talk all the time, he had a great line. He said, Benedict is not a statue in a museum, right? You know, I mean, he's a, he's a guy that, you know, I, I want to get his advice and his counsel and so on. And, and he also said something very interesting, which is that uh, he said he and Benedict had talked, because, you know, Benedict, when he resigned, said, I'm going to be hidden from the world. That was his famous line, I'm going to be hidden from the world. Francis said, I've talked to him, and I've told him, I want him to come out. I want him to be more involved in the life of the church. I want people to see him. Uh, and that's what led him to say, you know, in the old days, people used to get weirded out about the idea of having a retired bishop in the diocese while there was a new bishop, that somehow that would be confusing or disorienting. And by now, it's just, you know, second nature. No, no Catholic is confused about who's actually in charge. Uh, and his point was that we'll, we'll, get the, we'll get to the same thing, you know, with a retired pope. Uh, and he clearly left open the possibility that other popes, himself included, may, retire, may resign, although he clearly did not make any commitment uh, to do that. I, you know, there is a lot of speculation that, that Francis may well choose to do that. It would certainly would be in keeping with his personality. You know, not only the humility and simplicity, but also the desire to, in some sense, demystify the papacy. Right, and I mean, you know, he, if you notice, he rarely refers to himself as Pope. He much more commonly refers to himself as the Bishop of Rome. Uh, and so I think the idea th of, of stepping aside as Bishop uh, would, would not be a stretch for him theologically or intellectually. You know, when, it, when he was elected, I mean, actually one of the famous pieces about Francis the day after his election from one of his friends was four years of Bergoglio will be enough, you know, to change the church. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what he does. Um, uh, oh, and then the, the new thing on the economy. If you don't know, Pope Francis recently decided to create a new department in the Vatican called the Secretariat for the Economy, which is basically a kind of centralized finance ministry, uh, giving it the, the kind of power of the purse, that is, the power to inspect the books of every other office in the Vatican, to impose uh, annual budgets, to conduct quarterly reviews, basically to impose fiscal discipline. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this may seem like a no-brainer to you. I mean, I know as an American you're thinking, so what, okay? But I am here to tell you this is a revolution in the Vatican, okay? Because in the Vatican, every department there is accustomed to thinking of itself as its own autonomous little fiefdom, okay, with accountability only to the Pope and God, and in both cases totally nominally, okay? Uh, and so the idea that, that a pope would ride into town and say, you're actually going to be accountable for how much money you're spending, uh, and we want to we see what you're doing with it. Okay, th this is, I mean, I don't think there's any single act a pope could take that would be more terrifying to the old guard in the Vatican than this. Okay? Uh, and the fact that Francis has taken it is a, you know, what I've said uh, is that in Rome, because I was there in Rome when all this happened, you could, in Rome that week, hear the sound of the tectonic plates of the Catholic Church shifting <laughs> because this was an earthquake, okay? Uh, now, uh, Cardinal Pell, I have to say, I mean, I'm biased in this regard because I've known Pell for many years. I'm, you know, we're, we're personal friends and I'm a huge fan of the guy. Uh, and and I, I also have to say that, that he only gave three interviews after his appointment. One was to an Australian paper, the other was to an Italian business paper, and the third was to me. Okay, so I admit I may not be the most impartial of all observers, but, but here's what I can tell you about George Pell. You know, theologically, he's controversial, he's divisive. I mean, he's a strong conservative, and if you go into Australia, you will find the liberal wing of the Catholic Church regards him as Darth Vader. Okay, honestly, I mean, liberal Australian Catholics hear the imperial death march from Star Wars in their heads when he walks into a room, you know, dun, dun, da da right? Uh, so, you know, on that level, he can be polarizing. Well, he can't, not, he can't, I mean, he is polarizing at that level. Uh, but the one thing I can tell you uh, is that George Pill is 100% committed to good governance in the church. He actually was one of the leaders of the guerrilla insurrection in the conclave that produced the election of Pope Francis 
because nobody in the College of Cardinals is more frustrated with what he perceives to be the sleazy and pre-modern and sometimes corrupt ways of doing business in the Italian-dominated Vatican. Okay? Uh, and further, he doesn't just think that. Because, I mean, honestly, lots of cardinals from around the world think that. But what, what makes Pell unique uh, is that he has the backbone to get this done. The thing you have to understand about George Pell is that when he was a teenager, he was a star Australian rules football player. People thought he was going to go pro, okay, until he blew his knee out. I don't know if you've ever seen an Australian rules football game, okay, but this is NFL speed and this is NFL hits with no pads, okay? I mean, seriously, it's a weird game if two or three guys have not been carted out on an ambulance, okay? And he thrived, okay? He's a brawler. He's a battler, okay? I mean, he, he loves to kind of mix it up. Nobody uh, is going to push this guy around. Uh, and so I am convinced this is, this is not cosmetic reform. This is real reform. I actually wrote a piece in which I said this, this whole thing, 